Today, I want to do a little bit of talk about the kingdom of God. If you're not a member of the kingdom of God, I pray you will be by the time we end this talk, okay? There's nothing more important than what I'm going to be speaking about here today in the sense of being a part of what I'm talking about. Today we come to Article 9 of the Baptist Faith and Message, and it is the kingdom. And you may look at that and say, well, why do we need to know about the kingdom? Well, can I tell you something? God is very interested in government, but not in the way that you might think. So uh, let's go ahead and read it here this morning. The kingdom of God includes both his general sovereignty over the universe and his particular kingship over men who willfully acknowledge him as king. Particularly, the kingdom is the realm of salvation into which men enter by trustful, childlike commitment to Jesus Christ. Christians ought to pray and to labor that the kingdom may come and God's will be done on earth. Maybe you've heard that before. The full consummation of the kingdom awaits the return of Jesus Christ and the end of the age. Now the kingdom is God's government. And understanding government, I believe, is probably key to you understanding what's going on around you. You understand what I'm saying? Most people don't think very much uh, about government. Uh, They kind of just let it go along and don't realize how much it affects every aspect of your life. Will Rogers, he was a a cowboy, part Cherokee Indian, part entertainer, uh, lived back in the uh, 1920s, and he understood this. He used to make commentary about politics and different things of that nature. Uh, But he wrote this column, and even though these comments were made about a century ago, I think they are very telling to where we are today still, because we live in this American government. He said, Congress is so strange. A man gets up to speak and says nothing. Nobody listens, then everybody disagrees, right? (laughs) Is that not our government, right? And then he said, never blame a legislative body for not doing something. When they do nothing, they don't hurt anybody. When they do something is when they become dangerous, right? Amen. <laughs> amen. Amen. Oh, me both, right? Uh, that, that's kind of how uh, uh, government works. Will was kind of poking fun here at uh, the idea uh, of how our government works. And we kind of get those jokes because we live in that environment. He understood that the government you live under is really one of the most basic aspects of everyone's life because it affects us. Listen now. It affects us profoundly how the government works. Uh, The world has always been built on different governments. And to give you an idea, give you a definition of what a government is now, a government is the institution that possesses the basic authority to rule a society. Now, why do they do that? Why why does a government have the authority to rule a society? Well, this may surprise you. It's because they have the monopoly on violence in the society. If you don't do what the government says, violence will ensue, right? Regardless of any government throughout history, the ones who are in charge have the control over the violence, right, that takes place. Uh, Even the Bible tells us in Romans 13, He beareth not the sword... In vain, speaking of whatever government you've been living under. And and, and politics and government kind of go together. Politics describes the struggle for power that takes place within a government. Because even though a government has uh, the ability to use violence, that's not very financially good for them, right? They can't go around and put a cop on every corner to watch everything you do. There has to be this idea within the government where you choose to bow to its authority. They have to have this idea of a legitimacy. They have to argue that. Why should we follow what the government is saying? And that's what politics is. Uh, Although governments can and do exercise that authority by threat of armed violence, violence is an extremely expensive way to hold on to their power, right? Uh, Now, uh, it's much easier for governments when citizens obey their their, uh, rule voluntarily, right? No matter what government is. What government? Now, what I just described to you, though, if you think about it, it may turn the lights on for you concerning why you see the things that you see on the evening news, right? You see all sorts of things. What do you see? You see riots, right? Why are there riots going on? Because the people 
do not respect the authority of the government, and they go in and do what they want. And here's the thing. The government is always smaller than the people. Throughout history, the, the people are the, small, are the bigger group, right? Yeah. So the government, there's rioting happening because the people didn't like what the government did, even though they've got the authority. The gun grabs you've seen by the recent administration and these type of things going on. What's going on there? What's happening there? That's the government getting concerned because of uh, their violence. Back and forth, right? All of these things are in balance. The effectiveness of these people to go out and march in the street and get the government to do what they want, what's that about? It's about them arguing their legitimacy to power and saying, well, you don't have power over me if you keep pushing these things on me. So all of this stuff, all of this stuff that you see around you all the time, if you understand politics and government, you understand what's going on. But there's a deeper idea of government, okay? There's a higher view of all of these things. You understand what I'm saying? Say, my goodness, what did I come to? Some kind of American culture class this morning? I thought I'd come to church. Well, you did, okay? But there's more to it than all that. You hear what I'm saying? So uh, the idea here, uh, just to look at some of man's government over time. What's the best type of government? Well, we live in a democracy, right? A democracy. The people uh, are, are said to uh, be the ones who are in charge. It's a government for the people, by the people. Isn't that what it says in some of our founding documents? Here's the problem. What if the people are an evil people? It wouldn't be a good government then, right? Because if they're the ones who are choosing who's in power and they choose bad people to be who's in power, what happens? you got a bad government, right? you got something that's not good. So if there are evil people within a democracy, you're going to have a very bad government. There's no doubt about it. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. What about an oligarchy? Now, I had to look that up just to understand how to say it, okay? So y'all can give me a pat on the back later for that, all right? An oligarchy. An oligarchy is a government that's run just by a few people. And we've seen that over time, right? But here's the thing. What if those few people are bad people? What do you have, church? you got a bad government, right? Or what if uh, a monarchy, a monarchy. Now, now, this is the idea of a king, right? Now, this is probably the most effective way of government that you can possibly have is to have a monarchy. Really, no kidding. You only got to go through one person. That one person makes all the decisions, and they're the one in charge, right? Here's the problem, though. Can I tell you what the problem is? What if that one person in charge is a bad person? What do you have, church? you got a bad government, don't you? A bad government. But if you've got a good king, that'd be great, right? Oh, now here's one. Here's one we don't see yet. Now you see this today in Iran. Iran is a theocracy. And the idea of that is it is technically ruled by God, according to what they're saying is God. But since God rarely shows up to manage the day-to-day -day affairs, a theocracy, the rule is by the religious leaders who interpret God's will. So that's a theocracy, right? The religious leaders interpret what God is saying. Here's the problem with that, church. What if the religious pe people ain't good people? <laughs> what if they ain't good people? What, what do you have, church? You've got a bad government, right? So here we see all the different forms of government all down through the years, uh, all the human governments, and they're all pretty much effective in showing us that humanity just doesn't know how to govern himself, all right? It don't matter what type of government you got, okay? From democracy to monarchy to oligarchy uh, to theocracy, it doesn't matter what type of government it is, man will mess it up. Why? Because man is a sinful creature, right? Man is a sinful creature. All of these... God shows us in his word there's only one government that's worth having. Can I tell you that? Only one. A pure theocracy. A pure theocracy. That is one where actually, is actually run by God himself. It means he's there and he's going to take care of the day-to-day -day affairs. That, my friend, is what the kingdom of God is. Okay? The kingdom of God. And so um, the Bible, if you go through it, it's about the struggle for a kingdom. It is. Uh, the politics leading to it, you might say. A, a real physical kingdom that's going to come in the future. There's going to be a real physical kingdom that will be upon this earth run by God himself. Uh, it talks about in Revelation 20 and there's uncountable uh, Old Testament verses that allude to it moving forward, right? It's called the millennial reign of Christ. But there is a spiritual kingdom that leads into it. And that's a lot of what I want to look at here today. If you'll turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 17. Jesus was standing before the Pharisees here. And it says, when he was demanding to the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come. 
See, they were looking for it. He answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. You can't see it. Neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. You may be seated. Now, our Baptist faith and message tells us that the kingdom of God includes both His general sovereignty over the universe. That's part of it. And the idea of that is, for a Christian, if the kingdom of God is within you, God's your king. He's your first and foremost king, the, the ultimate one, right? But if you're out here in the world and there are these non-Christians who live out in the world, God is still in control of them, even though they don't know it, all right? They don't have a clue about it, but God is still in control. And there's a big difference there. That's what this general sovereignty over the universe means. See, God is bringing about what He wants in this world, even though the devil is the prince of the air and man creates his own uh, governments around him. Uh, There is this struggle between these governments of the world, these governments of the devil, and God. Between light and between dark that is going on out here in the world today. And... um, just because God is in control doesn't mean that you don't have free will, though. See, a lot of people err in this. They fall in this Calvinistic understanding. And they begin to think, well, I'm just a robot. And the only reason I come to church this morning is because God picked, made me get up and made me come to church. And I sat there and I sat down. I did my little worship. I went home. I was uh, Calvinistically uh, forced to do all these different things. When I got saved, I was forced to come to the altar by God. No! God got a hold of your heart and you made a decision. To follow Christ. God, God, you made a decision to come to this church, and it makes a difference in your life. Amen. A real, it makes a difference in history. It makes a difference in everything. Some of you sitting here today, it will affect future generations that will come out from you that you were sitting here this morning. You understand what I'm saying? It affects all of history. Uh, for example, the, have you ever heard of the Battle of Tours in 732 AD? You're probably not, right? You've probably not heard of the Battle of Tours in 732 A.D. It was highly important, though, if you know what it was. Uh, Muhammad had uh, taken over all of the lands over in the Middle East. They were all Christian at one time. They had went out, the disciples had, and all the area around them, Jerusalem and all of them, they'd all become Christian, right? That was a dominant group all throughout all the Middle East. You wouldn't know that today, would you? Because Islam began to spread by the sword. Islam was on a track to take over the world. And it was moving up into Western Europe when in 732 A.D. the Battle of Tours occurred. There was this man named Charles the Hammer Martel. He came down and he stopped that from happening in that battle. It was an impossible battle. It was an impossible win that halted the northward track of those Islamic hordes into Western Europe. It is the reason the church is still here, okay? Okay. I mean, we would have been very, very low in number today if, if, if it, Western Europe had been taken over by Islam. What would have carried over into America? Most likely Islam. So it would have been a whole different world you're living in today if what had not happened in 732 A.D. What if Charles had decided not to go fight that battle, though? What if he said, well, I think I'll stay home today. You know, Islam doesn't look that bad. Maybe I'll take that up, you know. I mean, What if that had occurred? Well, I am under the impression that God would have provided someone else just as He did with Queen Esther. Have you ever read the book of Esther? In in that book, it speaks about Esther. Uh, She was a Jewish queen. Nobody knew she was Jewish. She'd come to the kingdom and God uh, uh, brought her there. And she had to make a choice to go in before the king, which was life-threatening to step before that king uh, back during that time because he could have cut off your head just for walking in the door and trying to talk to him out of turn. So Esther made this choice, but, but God sent uh, some of her family to come tell her this in Esther 4, 14. It said to her, For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, if you stay quiet, if you don't go through that door, if you don't go in and you deal with that king right now, then there sh- shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. He said, I'm not going to let the Jews disappear from this place. You know why? Because through the Jewish line was going to come the, the king, the true king, all right? Jesus Christ. If you keep quiet about this, the Jews aren't going to be massacred like this king wants to do. That's what the king wanted to do. He wanted to come in and he wanted to massacre every Jew because he had been told this by a man named Haman. He said, deliverance will arise from another place, but thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. If you don't do this, you and your family are going to be destroyed. It's personal to you, all right? But who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom 
for such a time as this. Do you understand how important your decisions are? You really do? We go through our lives and we willy-dally around and we uh, say, well, it doesn't matter how I live, doesn't matter what I do, doesn't matter who I witness to, doesn't matter uh, what I do. It matters, okay? It matters to you. It matters to future generations. It matters. And what you do could destroy your future king, uh, your future people. But God's going to, in the big cane of things, everything's going to work out the way God wants, all right? Everything's going to work out the way God wants. But who knows whether you have come into God's kingdom for such a time as this. It goes on to say that there's a particular uh, kingship in that Baptist faith and message besides that general sovereignty God has. It's over men who willfully acknowledge Him as king, particularly this kingdom is a realm of salvation into which men enter by trustful, childlike commitment to Jesus Christ. Now this is what Jesus meant when he spoke of the kingdom of God. When you uh, got saved so long ago, Christian, uh, you came into the kingdom of God. You said, God's my king. You know, some people try to separate the lordship of God out of being saved. Folks, that don't, don't work. I confessed him Lord, right? I confessed the Lord Jesus and believed in my heart that God raised him from the dead. Thou shalt back be saved. He is the king. He is the Lord, right? He's the one in charge. That's what you did if you truly got saved. And even though this merry world moves around and on its merry way, God's calling out citizens for his kingdom and his government, and it is greater than this world's government. And here's the thing. If you really have uh, accepted Christ as your Savior, you need to live like it. In Acts 4, Peter and John are taken into custody by the religious rulers and they're told this, don't you go out and preach that name of Jesus anymore. Right? It says they called them and commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. Ooh, wait a minute. You've got into the higher kingdom here, right? I can speak on the kingdom of Jesus because that's my high king. I respect my rulers at the lower level, but that's my high king, right? That's the the higher one. But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken to you more than to God, judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. They were telling them there's a higher kingdom. And no matter what violence your earthly kingdom is going to put on me, I must follow that kingdom, right? Right? Amen or on me, yeah? I've got to follow the higher kingdom. Now, this point's kind of been on display here in the last year during all this COVID stuff, hasn't it? We've kind of seen some of this. Some, some state governors have been radical with bias. You know, I talked about it one Wednesday night. They, they, they had people coming out driving in to the churches out in the, in the parking lots, and they were coming in telling them they had to leave because they drove into a parking lot to worship. That was extreme bias, right? I thank God for the governor we have in Tennessee, Okay. He is a good governor. He has respected uh, the, the separation in church and state that we have seen. And that's been wonderful, right? Uh, we're blessed in Tennessee. But it might surprise you, you now we took restrictions here and took things that we've tried to do to keep people safe here. We didn't do that because of what the government was saying. We were hearing what the information was, but we didn't do that. We did it because of what God's government says. Do you know that? We did it because of what God's government says. You know what the first rule in God's government is? Love your neighbor. Love one another. Love one another. So that means be wise. We've tried to be wise in that, right? By loving one another. Second, don't tempt the Lord your God. That's another one, right? Isn't that part of what you do in God's kingdom? That's why I don't have snake handling. Praise God I don't have snake handling, right? (laughs) That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life, right? But what's any different than than going on acting like there ain't a, a pandemic going on around you? There ain't no difference, okay? And people saying, well, you got to have faith. I have faith in this right here, okay? This right here will lead me right to the kingdom of God. And that's what it's done. All right? I have faith in what the Word of God says. And you want to see real persecution, though? We, we see a taste of it there as people are showing bias toward us in that. But you want to see real persecution, you go down to China. Okay? You go down to China and you'll see some real persecution. The state church is the only one that's allowed to meet in public. And they tell them what they're going to preach, Okay? And they tell them that. Over the last several decades, it is known that China has forced abortions on its citizens as, a, as a, a control of the population. They've sterilized women without their consent. And listen to this, church. They've murdered religious minorities, that'd be Christians, in the midst of that. And they sell their organs on the black market. You want to talk about wicked. You go down to China. I have no respect for that government in China. All right? And you shouldn't either, okay? 
You shouldn't either. Christian home churches are over there because uh, you, can't, you can't stomp out the church of God. They're going to meet, okay? Attempt, they attempt to escape that governance scrutiny, but often they're raided and their members are arrested on charge of working against the interests of the state. Folks, I tell you what, there, that could be happening here in America one day. It may, it may well be, but that's okay, <laughs> right? I have a higher kingdom. Even though I die, I'm going to live, all right? It may be kind of rough down here, but even though I die, I'm going to live. We need to pray for our... I, go to uh, persecution.com. Look up the voice of the martyrs. You find you some people on there. There is an app that you can download where you can pray daily for a different persecuted nation. Please do that. I've got it on my phone. I don't hit it every day, but I try to hit it some. And I pray specifically for our brothers and sisters who are being persecuted across this world because they are facing persecution. All right? So um, what does it mean to be a citizen in all of this? Well, it goes on to say Christians ought to pray and to labor that the kingdom may come and God's will be done on earth. And that full consummation of that kingdom awaits the return of Jesus Christ at the end of the age. Now, we've all been taught to say the Lord's Prayer, right? You ever say the Lord's Prayer? You remember that in church saying that? Uh, Thy kingdom come. Wait a minute. Ain't that what we're talking about? Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And that reminds us that the kingdom, the full physical kingdom, isn't here yet. There's a physical kingdom coming. It was offered to the Jews, uh, Jewish people long ago, but they rejected it, that physical kingdom on earth. And when Jesus came the first time, they rejected that. But now we're looking forward to that. When the rapture takes place, it'll open up that seven years of tribulation, that millennial reign of Christ will come, that physical kingdom, and praise God, we'll be right there in the midst of it, won't we? But, but uh, Jesus spoke about that when he was before Pilate in John 18, 36. Uh, Jesus answered him when he's talking about his kingdom. He says, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now, oh, listen to that. Pay attention to every little word in the the Bible. But now is my kingdom not from hence. In this passage, that word now shows a shift. uh, Speaking about the spiritual kingdom of God, which is when the heart of the redeemed, but moves on saying there's going to be a literal political kingdom yet to come on this earth, that thousand-year millennial reign of Jesus Christ. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. It's coming. It's coming. Now, here's something interesting about that. I want to note that that word now, if you're holding an NIV NIV or an NSB or a... uh, other of these modern translations that use the critical Greek text, that word now has been removed. It's been removed. But in the KJV and the NKJV, it's still there because they use the traditional text of Scripture to translate from. But they took that word out. I wonder why that word's been taken out. I don't think it's some kind of a, a conspiracy that those people are doing. I think they're just ignorant of the devil's devices, okay? The devil does not like the idea that God's kingdom's going to come on this earth, does he? He'd like to keep that hid from you, wouldn't he? He'd like to keep that hid. He don't want to hear nothing about the kingdom coming, right? But the kingdom's going to come. Christians down throughout the centuries have prayed and prayed and prayed. Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. It's coming, right? It's coming. It's coming. Now here's the thing. Don't think that you're the one that's going to make it come. (laughs) <laughs> All right? That's the point I want you to see. You're not going to make that physical kingdom come, but you've got to say in that spiritual kingdom, okay? Uh, Russell Moore, he said this. He said those who would pretend to enforce the kingdom with tanks or guns or laws or edicts do not understand the nature of the kingdom Jesus preached. We're not Islam. We don't spread it by the sword, Okay? <laughs> We don't spread it by government authority. I can tell you that you have to go to church by a law that that might be put in by Congress. But folks, you're not really part of the kingdom of God. Okay? You're being forced by some rule or some law. I can tell you to live morally. And I think there are good laws that need to be put in place to replace bad laws that are already there. No no doubt about that. That can make the world a better place to be in. Right? But the fact is, if you want to stay away from sexual immorality... It's right here, okay? The kingdom of God's within you. Are you going to listen to what God, your king says or not? Are you going to stay away from alcohol or not? Which one's it going to be? Are you going to stay away from uh, all these different pornography? Are you going to stay away from, from all these different things? Why do you stay away from those things, church? Because the kingdom of God's within you, ain't it? You have a higher king, don't you? 
So you've got to follow. It's up to you to follow the king, okay? It's up to you. If he's really your king, it's up to you to follow him. Christ uh, will come by, bring violence upon this earth, just like every government does, though, when he comes back to br- take, take this place back, right? The physical return of Jesus Christ, it's going to happen. One more thing, one more thing. I'll leave you with this. Matthew 6, Jesus speaking said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Amen. We're to live as citizens of a greater kingdom. And the problem today is more people live as a citizen of an earthly kingdom. They're more worried about what's going on uh, in their own earthly physical um, ideas. See, in this passage, Jesus is telling the people to quit worrying about living under those earthly governments, thinking, well, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Wherewith shall we all be clothed? What are we going to take care of all these physical raiment? What would happen if we quit worrying about the politics of this world and start being concerned about adding citizens to the kingdom of God? There was a popular phrase that our past president had. He said, let's make America great again. Can I tell you how to do that? You have more people in the kingdom of God. All right? You wonder why all this stuff's going on around you? Why all this upheaval? You know, if all the news media was saved, you'd never hear a lie. You'd never hear a twist. You'd hear the absolute truth coming out of those uh, presses, wouldn't you? Right? Am I right? Yeah. If the television was uh, the people that put on uh, over in Hollywood all the movies and stuff, if they were all saved, you'd have the cleanest movies to take your family to that you could imagine, wouldn't you? But you know what? They ain't all saved, right? They ain't in the kingdom. They're in the kingdom of darkness, not the kingdom of light. If everybody was uh, saved out here in the government, my goodness, the wonderful laws that would come out of the Supreme Court, if they all knew Jesus Christ as their Savior. But you know, I can't go in there and say, let me hold this knife to your throat. You're going to come one of the kingdom of God. That ain't going to happen, is it? That's not how the kingdom works, right? You've got to go out here and live it right before them. And then they'll see we're a witness. We live in the midst of a dangerous time in our world. And it's more important now that we serve as a witness to our God than it ever has been before. It really is. Folks, we've got whole generations falling off to the side here. Whole generations are falling off to the side and not coming to the knowledge of Christ. And what will that mean for the future? Martyr, that's somebody we know today as somebody who died for their faith, right? You know what that word martyr started out as? Simply as a witness. A witness. Will you be a witness to the kingdom of God that is within you? Will you do that? You can make that decision to join it here today. May make that decision to continue in it. I don't know. But I think we need to do business with God here this morning. All right? I hope you're enjoying the sermons here and have subscribed to my channel on YouTube. But I would love even more to meet with you in person at the church where I'm blessed to pastor at in White Pine, Tennessee, Omega Baptist Church.